the shooting range. In this episode, Pages of History, Old MBT's Second Youth. Ground Study, Comparing Top Radar Guided Missiles. And Metal Beasts, Versatile Falcon. Soon after their debut, fourth-generation fighters pushed aside their predecessors and made a statement about their efficiency as air superiority fighters. Their strike capabilities, however, weren't as impressive. It took some time and a modernization process to create truly versatile models. Today's Metal Beast is one of those modernized creations. Please welcome a multi-role Falcon, the F-16C Block 50. This machine is propelled by a bypass turbojet engine with an afterburner. Its fuel is stored in the fuselage and between the wing spars, as well as in an optional drop tank. The nose cone hides a powerful radar system, and the left leading edge root extension houses a six-barreled 20mm cannon. The aircraft's eight hardpoints can carry infrared and radar-guided air-to-air missiles, conventional bombs and rockets, as well as laser and TV-guided air-to-surface munitions. Target designation is provided by the Lightning II pod. The F-16C received an extra 2.5 ton forces of thrust for its engine, but its mass also increased. This resulted in improvements in some areas and downgrades in others, with the average flight performance remaining just as high as on previous models. The new F-16's radar is also more sensitive. It provides a reliable level of long-range enemy detection and missile guidance. Early in a battle, you can use one of the best radar-guided missiles, the AIM-7M. And if your enemy manages to get close, it's time for the AIM-9M. Of course, the latter can't compete with the R-73 in maximum overloads, but the top sidewinders are currently the best overall missiles in their class. Their low-smoke motors make launches hard to detect, and their homing device can ignore countermeasures in certain aspects, thanks to special algorithms for detecting flares. In addition to cutting-edge missiles, the F-16C has a helmet-mounted display, 120 flares and chaff, an advanced radar warning system, a ballistic computer for the cannon, basically everything that you can use in aerial combat. This American plane is just as good in mixed battles. It can carry up to six laser-guided bombs or two bombs and six AGM-65D Maverick infrared homing missiles. With its extreme flight performance and a targeting pod equipped with thermals, delivering close air support on the F-16C is a simple and comfortable activity. And finally, we simply have to talk about the looks. Our artists have prepared special camos for this plane. A perfect look for a perfect fighter. Scrapping old vehicles and building new ones has always been such an expensive process that even wealthy nations sometimes can't afford it. Meanwhile, technical progress is always marching on, pushing the bar with every step. A classic example of a rational solution to this is what was done to the first and second generation main battle tanks. Simply throwing them away was too expensive, especially during the Cold War, when each combat-worthy vehicle mattered. That's why outdated MBTs were, and still are, modernized across the world. Today we'd like to follow the engineering thoughts that pulled up the firepower of old tanks to acceptable levels. The theoretical shift in firepower between the first and the second generations of MBTs happened when 105mm rifled cannons were picked as the primary ones. For instance, the switch to L7 and M68 guns helped the Centurion, M48, and M60 tanks stay relevant even today. Soviet tanks were similarly rearmed with 100mm airs to the D-10 gun and 115mm smoothbore cannons. Another major part of the upgrade process was adding two plane stabilizers to almost every MBT. There was only one nation who picked a unique path, the French. 
Their AMX-30 did get a stabilizer in a prototype and in the export super modification, but neither of those left the test stage. Engineers also developed new shells to help old cannons hit modern MBTs, primarily of the fin-stabilized discarding sabot type. The most advanced 105mm ones even outperformed early 120 and 125mm shells. The Soviet Union also employed another approach. The late T-55 and T-62 received guided munition systems. The most radical approach to upgrading firepower on old machines involved rearming them with the weapons of modern MBTs. For instance, the Germans tried to add a 120mm cannon to the Leopard 1. It was successfully fitted and even made to work, but the project was ultimately discarded. A similar thing happened to the Turkish M60 AMBT. It lost out to the competition. Now, the engineers also paid extra attention to fire control systems. Even the earliest MBTs needed laser rangefinders and ballistic computers. Visibility was another major point. Old tanks received improved observation devices with a wider field of view, while commander sights and rotating cupolas became more widespread. Later, panoramic sights gained some traction, sometimes with high magnification levels as well. Target designation systems and their usage were changed too, Another thing to be added was redundant turret and fire control systems for the commander, in case the gunner was taken out. For instance, South Africa added redundant controls for the Oliphant Mark II, which is a deep modernization of the Centurion. Night vision devices became a must for the commander, the gunner, and the driver. Although finding enough thermals for everyone proved to be a difficult task. The Soviet T-55 and T-62, as well as the Japanese Type 74, missed out on them, for example. Overall, we can say that modernizing first and second generation MBTs involved vastly more than simply improving firepower. Ensuring peak combat performance for existing weaponry was just as important, if not more, essential. What's the use of a large and powerful gun if the commander can't spot a target, or if the gunner needs more time to sight it than the enemy? As for upgrading the defenses and the driving performance of main battle tanks, that's a story for another time. Following your requests in the comments, today's round study will compare top semi-active radar-homing air-to-air missiles. The contest will feature the American AIM-7 Sparrow, modifications F and M, the Soviet R-27R and ER, and the French Matra Super 530, versions F and D. To even out the playing field, we'll be using a carrier platform with a speed of about 1,000 kilometers an hour at 1,000 meters of altitude. We will also ignore the radar capabilities of fighters this time. A paramount quality for any missile is its maximum effective launch range. We'll begin testing with a target flying straight at the same altitude and speed as our carrier. The first launch will be a frontal one, and the second time we'll be chasing the target from the rear. The lowest result here is shown by the French Matra Super 530F. Its effective launch range can't exceed 20 kilometers in a head-on engagement. The R-27R and the 530D perform better. They can hit the same target from 22 kilometers away. Both Sparrows are even better with 28 kilometers, and the best result is shown by the R-27ER. Its effective range in a front aspect launch can reach 34 kilometers. Now let's do some chasing. This time, the worst result, with less than 5 kilometers, is shown by the French 530F and the Soviet R-27R. The 530D improved that by around a kilometer, while the American Sparrows managed to hit the target even when launched from 7 kilometers away. And the best performance here is shown by the R-27ER again. Its maximum effective range in a rear aspect launch is around 10 kilometers. Time for a more difficult task. Our targets will maneuver a little so that the missiles lose some of their velocity. We want to compare the launch ranges that keep the available overload of the missiles within 15 Gs at the end of their trajectory. It's enough to hit the target. Effective ranges in head-on engagements plummeted for all participants here by 25 to 50% in some cases. 
The lowest result here is again shown by the French Matra Super 530F. Then we have the R-27R, the second French missile, the Sparrow, and the R-27ER. Now, what if we did the same tests, but at 10 kilometers of altitude instead of just one? Okay, okay, that's way too many numbers for a single episode. We'll just tell you about the best results. At an altitude of 10 kilometers and a starting speed of 1,500 kilometers an hour, the Sparrows can hit a non-maneuvering target from almost 76 kilometers, while the Soviet R-27ER can do that from 73. Having a longer operational time helps the American missile a lot here. With a maneuvering target, the R-27 wins. Its available overload stays within 15 Gs even at a range of 53 kilometers, against only 33 shown by the M7 Sparrow. Tell us in the comments what weapons you'd like to see next. Meanwhile, it's time for us to answer some of your questions. The first question was sent by a player called Ottavio Enrique. I started using the P47D22, and I'm having some trouble. Any tips to improve? Hi, Ottavio. When you join a battle with a P47, try to climb as high as you can and use energy tactics while avoiding turn fights. The Thunderbolt's main advantage is super long range engagements, so don't be shy around that trigger. Cookie Lord asks, What's the difference between the Ferdinand and the Elephant? Hey, Cookie Lord. In fact, there's no tangible difference. Both of these names could be used to refer to the same machines in real life. The in-game version of the Elephant has a cupola on the casemate roof and a machine gun nest in the front of the hull. Another question comes from Leynad. If you activate a best squad wager and then go into a solo queue, what'll happen if you don't get auto-squatted? Hi there. The best squad wager will just ignore that battle. It'll be neither complete nor failed. The 23rd Radio Tower writes, I just got the M18, but I'm struggling with it. Any tips? Hello again, Tower. You can check out episode number 300. We talked about tactics for light tanks there. All of the hints are valid for the M18 as well. And the last comment for today was written by Dead Snake War. Will you guys ever do a history episode behind the G6 Rhino development? Hi there, Dead Snake. Thank you for this suggestion. See it soon on The Shooting Range. That's it for today. You've been watching The Shooting Range by Gaijin Entertainment, and the next episode will premiere the following Sunday at 4 p.m. GMT or noon Eastern Time. Subscribe and click the bell if you don't want to miss our next videos. Don't forget to start making your L3 costume for Halloween. Leave a like. Share your thoughts and comments, and see you next week!